Hello and welcome to Vanguard Audiobooks. Today we're going to do Francis Parker Yaki and his Imperium. And we did the introduction last time, so today we're going to start with the text proper. We did the introduction by Willis Cardo and then the foreword by Yaki himself. So you can find this and everything we do at vnnforum.com. And let's get going. Let's see. The 20th Century Historical Outlook. He has a bunch of smallish sorts of uh, chapters. Thus, as we do, and it, it's a couple of epigraphs from Carlyle and then Spengler. The 20th Century Historical Outlook is where it begins. Quote from Carlyle. Thus, as we do nothing but enact history, we say little but recite it. Nay, rather in that widest sense, our whole spiritual life is built thereon. For strictly considered... What is all knowledge to but recorded experience, and a product of history, of which, therefore, reasoning and belief, no less than action and passion, are essential materials? And then Spengler, the individual's life is of importance to none besides himself. The point is whether he wishes to escape from history or give his life for it. History wrecks nothing of human lo logic. And that by wrecks he means reckons, R-E-C-K-S. History wrecks nothing of human logic. New heading, perspective. Far out in exterior darkness, where no breath stirs, no light shines, and no sound is heard, one can glance toward this spinning earth ball. In the astral regions, illumination is of the soul, hence all is dark, but this certain star and only a part of it is aglow. From such a distance, one can obtain an utterly untrammeled view of what is transpiring on this earth ball. Drawing somewhat closer, continents are visible. Closer yet, population streams. One focal point exists whence the light goes forth in all directions. It is the crooked peninsula of Europe. On this tiny pendant of the great landmass of the earth ball, that'd be Euro-Asia, the greatest intensity of movement exists. You know, talk about one of those uh, maps showing the uh, electricity or showing the internet usage, and you see that that's what he's talking about. One can see out here the soul and its emanations are visible. A concentration of ideas, energy, ambition, purpose, expansiveness, will to form. Hovering above Europe, we can see what was never before so clearly visible. The presence of a purely spiritual organism. I'd say light gives that effect. A close look reveals that the light stream is not flowing from the surface of Europe upward into the night sky, but downward from hitherto invisible organism, the hitherto invisible organism. This is a discovery of profound and revolutionary importance, which was only vouchsafed to us by reason of our complete detachment from terrestrial events in the outer void, where spirit is visible and matter visible only by reason of the light from the spirit. More discoveries follow. On the other side are two islands, small in comparison with the land mass. The pale glow diffused over isolated parts of these two islands is seen at once to be a reflection from the other side. What is this supra-terrestrial phenomenon? Why does it hover over Europe in particular? What is the relationship between it and the human material under it? The latter is shaped up intricately into intricately formed pyramidal structures. Pyramidal, pyramidal. Ranks are formed. <coughs> Movements proceed along channels of labyrinthine complexity. Persons stand to one another and define relationships of command and obedience. Apart from this tiny peninsula, the human currents are horizontal, swirling, eddying like the water in the streams, the currents in the ocean, the herds on the vast plains. It is then the spirit organism which forms and impresses the population of the peninsula into their intricate organic shapes. With what can we compare this being which could not be seen by us while we were earthbound? It is alone at present. But out here we have the freedom of time as well as the freedom of space. We are allowed to look upon a hundred generations as the earthbound look upon the lifespan of a fruit fly. In our search for something similar to the spirit organism we have seen, we go back 200 generations. The ball is the same, but is in almost complete darkness. Things are almost indistinguishable. Matter has not yet passed through the alembic of spirit and is not apprehensible. 
A glance backward reveals a continuation of the void. We let a few generations pass in a moment, and spirit begins to make itself felt. A feeble but promising glow appears in Northeast Africa. That'd be Egypt. Then another thousand miles to the northeast in Mesopotamia. The Tigris and Euphrates. They take the names Egypt, Babylonia. The time is around 3000 BC. They increase in intensity and the first thing clear in each case is armies marching against the outer populations who are felt as the barbarian. These spiritual organisms do not mix. Their higher frontiers are sharp and clear. Each being has its own hue, which adheres to it. Each organism seizes the human material in its landscape and impresses them into its service. First it gives them a common world idea, capital W, capital I, and hyphenated world idea. First it gives them a common world idea. Then it refines this into nations, in italics. Each nation embodying a separate, high, a separate idea of the higher organism. A nobility and a priesthood arise to embody different aspects of the idea. The populations are stratified and specialized, and the human beings live out their lives and destinies in a way entirely subordinate to the higher organism. The latter compels these humans with ideas. Only a small spiritual stratum of each human population is adapted to this kind of compulsion, but those who belong to it remain in the service of the idea once it is felt. They will live and die for it, and in the process they determine the destinies of the population whence they spring. These ideas, not mere abstractions, strings of concepts, but living, pulsating, wordless necessities of being and thinking, are the technique by which these higher beings utilize human beings for their purposes. Religions of high complexity of feeling and rationale, forms of architecture conceived in the spirit of that religion and put into its service, lyric poetry, pictorial art, sculpture, music, orders of nobility, rigid training of the young, up to these developments to perpetuate them, systems of philosophy, of mathematics, of knowledge, of nature, prodigious technical methods, giant battles, huge armies, prolonged wars, energetic ec economics to support this whole multifarious structure, intricately organized governments to infuse order into the nations created by the higher being acting on the different types of human material. These are some of the florizon of forms which appear in these two areas. The complexification of human society. Human society is an organic whole rather than a collection of motley individuals or even just individuals at all. Each form is different in Egypt from the corresponding form in Babylonia. If an idea is taken over, it is only apparently adopted <coughs> Actually, it is misunderstood, reformed, and adapted to the proper soul. But the higher being approaches a crisis. It has expended itself in this earth-transforming process. It shudders, apparently weakens. It palpitates. Chaos and anarchy threaten its terrestrial actualizations. Forces outside gather to strike it down and wipe out its grand creations. But it rouses itself and puts forward its greatest effort of all. No longer in the creation of inward things, arts, philosophy, theories of life, but in the formation of the purely external apparatus of power. Strict governments, giant armies, industries to support them, fleets of ships for war, legal systems to organize and order the conquests. It expands across areas never before investigated or even known. It unifies all of its proper nations into one, which gives its name to the rest and leads them on to the last great expanse of effort. The same great rhythm is observable in each of them. As one watches, the two lights die down from their splendid hues to an ever paler earth light. They go out slowly, leaving a glow of memory and legend in the minds of men, and with their last great creations lying in the widened landscape, Imperium. Outside these two areas, the rest of the earth has remained unchanged. The human bands are distinguishable from the herding animals only by a primitive culture and a more intricate economy. 
Otherwise, their existence forms are devoid of significance. The primitive cultures are the sole thing existing above the plane of economics in that they attribute symbolic significance to natural occurrences in human conduct. He's talking about Africans and Aborigines, not that level of hominid. But there is nothing in these movements resembling the high cultures which transformed the entire appearance of the Egyptian and Babylonian landscapes for almost 40 generations from their first beginning until the last sinking. Physical time flows on and centuries pass in darkness. Then, precisely as in Egypt and Babylonia, but again of a different hue and to different music, a light appears over the Punjab. It becomes bright and firm. The same wealth of forms and significant happenings work themselves out as in the earlier two organisms. Its creations are all in the highest degree individual, as different from its two predecessors as they were vis-a-vis -vis one another, but they follow the same grand rhythms. The same multicolored pageant of nobles and priests, temples and schools, nations and cities, arts and philosophies, armies and sciences, letters and wars, passes before the eye. And then 2, Roman numeral 2. Before this high culture was well in its way, another had started to actualize itself in the Huang Ho Valley in China. H-W-A-N-G hyphen Ho. And then a few centuries later, about 1100 B.C., in our way of reckoning, the classical culture begins on the shores of the Aegean. Both of these cultures have the stamp of individuality on their way of <clears throat> their own way of coloring and influencing their terrestrial creations, but both are subject to the same morphology as the others observed. As this classical culture draws to its close around the time of Christ, another one appears, subjugated by the classical in its last expansive phase, Arabia. The fact of its appearance precisely here makes its course an unusual one. Its forms are inwardly as pure as those of all the other cultures. Inwardly it borrows nothing any more than they did. But it was inevitable that the material contiguity of the landscape, temporal succession, and contact with the civilized populations of the older organism would influence the new soul to take over the wealth of classical creations. It was subjugated to them only in a superficial way, however, for into these old bottles it poured its new wine. Through selection, reinterpretation, or ignoring, it expressed its own soul, despite the alien forms. In its later expansive phase, this culture embraced European Spain as the Western Caliphate. Its lifespan, its end form, its last great crisis, all followed the same organic regularity as the others. Some five centuries later, the now familiar manifestations of another high culture begin in the remote landscapes of Mexico and Peru. It is to have the most tragic destiny of any we have yet seen. Around 1000 AD, the European culture is meanwhile born, and at its very birth shows itself to be distinguished from the others by the extraordinary intensity of its self-expression, by its pushing into every distance both in the spiritual realm and in the physical. Its original landscape was even of an extent many times the size of its predecessors, and from this space, in its middle life, it enters upon an age of discovery, in which it finds for itself the very frontiers of the earth ball and converts the world into the object of its politics. Its Spanish representatives in the two warrior bands of Cortez and Pizarro discovered the civilization of Mexico and Peru, then in its very last stage of refinement of the material life. The two grand empires of Mexico and Peru, with social forms, economico-political organization, transportation, communication, city life, all developed to the utmost limits for this particular soul, made the invading Spaniards seem like mere naive barbarians. But the technical disinterestedness of these empires left them helpless before the few cannon and horses of the invaders. The modern leftists would say it was mainly disease that killed them. The last act of this culture drama is its obliteration in a few years by the invaders from another world. As we move on to page 9, this consummation is instructive as to the attention that the world spirit pays to human values and feelings. What soothsayer would have dared to tell the last Aztec emperor, surrounded with the pomp of world historical significance, clothed with the power of the world, 
that in a short time the jungle would reconquer his cities and palaces, that his armies and systems of control of his world empire would vanish before the onslaught of a few hundred barbarians. Each culture soul is stamped with individuality. From the others it takes nothing, and to them it gives nothing. Whatever is on its frontiers is the enemy, whether primitive or culture populations. They all are barbarians, heathens to the proper culture, and no understanding passes between them. We saw the Western peoples prove the lifeworthiness of the European culture by their crusades against the highly civilized Saracens, Moors, and Turks. We saw the Germanic populations in the East and their Visigothic brothers in the South push the barbarian Slavs and the civilized Moors continually back during the centuries. We saw Western ships and Western armies make the world whole, and make the whole world into the object of booty for the West. These were the relations of the West to that and those outside. Within the culture arose Gothic Christianity, the transcendent symbols of empire and papacy, the Gothic cathedrals, the unlocking of the secrets of the world of the soul and the world of nature and monastery cells. The culture soul shaped for its own expression the nations of the West. To each it gave individuality, and at last each thought it was a culture in itself instead of being a mere organ of culture, of a culture. So he's saying the European nations are organs of a culture, not a culture in themselves, as we might hear other places, and they might think. Cities grew out of the hamlets of Gothic times, and from the cities grew intellect. The old problem of the relation of reason and faith, the central problem of early scholastic, is apparently being slowly decided in these cities in favor of the supremacy of reason. The nobility of Gothic times, the masters of the earth who had no superior unless they voluntarily recognized him, became become subject to an idea, the state. Life slowly externalizes. Political problems move into the center. New economic resources are developed to support the political contests. The old agricultural economy metamorphoses into an industrial economy. At the end of this path stands a ghostly and terrifying idea money. Other cultures also had seen this phenomenon appear at the same stage and grow to similar dimensions. Its slow growth in importance proceeds pari passe. With the gradual self-assertion of reason against faith, it reaches its highest point with the age of nationalism, when the parts of the culture tear one another to bits, even as outer dangers loom threateningly. At its highest point, money allied with rationalism contest for the supremacy over the life of the culture with the forces of state and tradition, society and religion. In our brief visit to interstellar space, we found the position of detachment whence we could see this grand life drama unfold itself seven times in seven high cultures, and we saw each of the seven surmount the, lace, the last great crisis of two centuries duration. The Mexican-Peruvian civilization overcame the inner crisis only to fall before marauders appearing out of the blue sea. The great crisis of the West set in forcefully with the French Revolution and its consequent phenomena. Napoleon was the symbol of the transition of culture into civilization. Civilization, the life of the material, the external, of power, giant economies, armies and fleets, of great numbers and colossal technics. Over culture, the inner life of religion, philosophy, arts, domination of the external life of politics and economics by strict form and symbolism, strict restraint of the beast of prey in man, feeling of cultural unity. It is the victory of rationalism, money, and the great city over the traditions of religion and authority, of intellect over instinct. We had seen all this in the previous high cultures as they approached their final life phase, in each case, the crisis had been resolved by the resurgence of the old forces of religion and authority, their victory over rationalism and money, and the final union of the nations into an imperium. The two-century-long crisis in the life of the great organism expressed itself in gigantic wars and revolutions. All the cultural energy that had previously gone into inner creations of thought, religion, philosophy, science, art forms, great literature, now goes into the outer life of economics, war, 
Technics Politics. The symbolism of power succeeds to the highest place in this last phase. But at this point we are suddenly back on the surface of the earth. No longer detached, we must participate in the great culture drama, culture capitalized, whether we will or no. Our only choice is to participate as subject or as object. The wisdom that comes from the knowledge of the organic nature of a high culture, H and C capitalized, gives us the key to the events transpiring before our eyes. It can be applied by us and our action can thereby become significant as distinguished from the opportunistic and old-fashioned policy of stupidity, which would try to turn the Western civilization back in its course because stupid heads are incapable of adjusting themselves to new prevailing ideas. Moving on to Roman numeral three. With the knowledge of the organic nature of a high culture, we have achieved an unparalleled liberation from the dross of materialism which hindered hitherto the glimpse into history's riddle. This knowledge is simple but profound, and is therefore shut off from the inward appreciation of all but the few. In its train flow all the consequences of the necessary historical outlook of the coming times. Since a culture is organic, it has an individuality and a soul. Thus it cannot be influenced in its depths from any outside force whatsoever. It has a destiny like all organisms. It has a period of gestation and a birth time. It has a growth, a maturity, fulfillment, a downgoing, a death. Because it has a soul, all of its manifestations will be impressed by the same spiritual stamp, just as each man's life is the creation of his own individuality. Because it has a soul, this particular culture can never come again after it is past. Like the nations it creates to express phases of its own life, it exists only once. There will never be another Indian culture Aztec Mayan culture, classical culture, or Western culture, any more than there will be a second Spartan nation, Roman nation, French or English nation. Since a culture is organic, it has a lifespan. We observe this lifespan. It is about 35 generations at highest potential, or about 45 generations from its first stirrings in the landscape until its final subsiding. Like the lifespan of organizations, it is no rigid thing. Man has a lifespan of 70 years, but this term is not rigid. The high cultures belong at the peak of the organic hierarchy. Plant, animal, man. They differ from the other organisms in that they are invisible, or in other words, they have no light quality. In this they resemble the human soul. The body of a high culture is made up of the population streams in its landscape. They furnish it with the material through which it actualizes its possibilities. The spirit which animates these populations shows the life phase of the culture, whether youthful, mature, or at the last fulfillment. Like each man, a culture has ages which succeed one another with rhythmic inevitability. They are laid down for it by its own organic law, just as the senility of a man is laid down at his conception. This quality of direction we call destiny. Destiny is the hallmark of every, everything living. Destiny thinking is the type of thought which understands the living, and it is the only kind which does. <clears throat> the other method of human thought is that of causality. This method is inwardly compulsory in dealing with inorganic problems of technics, mechanics, engineering, systematic natural philosophy. It finds the limits of its efficacy there, however, and it is grotesque when applied to life. It would tell us that youth is the cause of maturity, maturity of old age, that the bud is the cause of the full-blown flower, the caterpillar the cause of the butterfly. The destiny idea, capital D, capital I, and hyphenated, he, does, he has a lot of that sort of abstraction. The destiny idea is the central motive of organic thinking. If anyone thinks it is merely an invisible causality, he understands it not. The idea of causality is the central motive of systematic or inorganic thinking. The latter is scientific thinking. It aims at subjugation, italics, of things to understanding. It wishes to name everything, to make outlines distinct, and then to link phenomena together by classification and causal linkage. Kant, K-A-N-T, is the height of this type of thinking, and to this side of Western philosophy belong also Hume, 
Bacon, Schopenhauer, Hamilton, Spencer, Mill, Bentham, Locke, Holbach, and Descartes. To the organic side belong Machiavelli, Vico, Montaigne, Leibniz, Lichtenberg, Pascal, Hobbes, Goethe, Hegel, Carlyle, Nietzsche, and Spengler, the philosopher of the 20th and 21st centuries. Scientific thinking is at the height of its power in the realm of matter, that which possesses extension but no direction. Material happenings can be controlled, are reversible, produce identical results under identical conditions, are recurrent, can be classified, can be successfully comprehended, as though they are subject to an a priori mechanical necessity, in other words, to causality. Scientific thinking is powerless in the domain of life, for its happenings are uncontrollable, irreversible, never recurring, unique, cannot be classified, and are unamenable to rational treatment, and possessed of no external mechanical necessity. Every organism is something never seen before that follows an inner necessity, that passes away, never to reappear. Every organism is a set of possibilities within a certain framework, and its life is the process of actualization of those possibilities. The technique of destiny thinking is simply living into other is is simply living into other organisms living into being in italics the technique of destiny thinking is simply living into other organisms to understand their life conditions and necessities one can then apprehend what must happen the word fate is an inorganic word it is an attempt to subjugate life to an external necessity it is of religious provenance background and origins and religion comes from the causal type of thinking there is no science without a precedent religion science merely makes the sacred causality of religion into a profane mechanical necessity fate is not synonymous with destiny but the opposite to it fate attributes necessity to the incidents of a life but destiny is the inner necessity of an organism an incident can wipe out a life and thus terminate its destiny but this event came from the outside the organism and was thus apart from its destiny. Every fact is an incident, unforeseeable and incalculable, but the inner progression of a life is destined and works itself out through the facts, is helped or hindered by them, overcomes them or succumbs to them. It is the destiny of every child that is born ultimately to become senile. Incident may intervene in the form of a disease or accident, and this destiny may be frustrated. These outer incidents that may elevate a man to the heights despite his blunders or cast him into defeat despite his efficiency and mastery of the idea of his time are without meaning for destiny thinking. Destiny inheres in the organism, <clears throat> forces it to express its possibilities. Incident is outside the organism, is blind, uninformed by necessity, but may nevertheless play a great role in the actualization of an organism by smoothing its way or imposing great obstacles to it. What is called luck, doom, fate, providence express the bafflement and awe of men in the presence of this mystery forever unknowable. Destiny thinking and causality thinking are related to one another, however, through their common providence. Both are products of life. Even the most inorganic thinker or scientifico, the crassest materialist or me mechanist, is subject to his own destiny, his own soul, his own character, his own lifespan, and outside this framework of destiny, his free unbound flight of causal fancy cannot deliver him. Destiny is life, but causality is merely a thought method by which a certain form of life namely culture man, attempts to subjugate all around him to his understanding. Thus there is an order of rank between them. Destiny thinking is unconditionally prior, for all life is subject to it, while causality thinking is only an expression of a part of life's possibilities. Their differences may also be expressed in this way. Causality thought is able to understand because its non-living material opposes no resistance, but submits to any conditions imposed upon it, having no inner compulsion of its own. 
When, however, causality attempts to subjugate life, the material itself is active, moving independently, will not stand still and be classified or systematized. Destiny thinking can understand because each one of us is himself moved by destiny, has an inner compulsion to be himself, and can thus, by transference of inwardly experienced feelings, live himself into other forms of life, other individuations. Destiny thinking moves along with its subject matter. Causality stands still and can only reach satisfactory conclusions with subject matter that is also standing still. Just as even the most highly developed systematizers are subject to destiny, so do they, all unwittingly, apply destiny thinking in their daily lives and relationships with other human beings. The most rabid reflexologist unconsciously applies some of the psychological wisdom of the Abbe Galliani, or Rochefoucauld, <coughs> Rochefoucauld the, the French uh, wit, satir, uh, epigrammatist, even though he has never heard of these seers of the soul. So let's repeat that sentence again. The most rabid reflexologist unconsciously applies some of the psychological wisdom of the Abbe Galliani, like the priest Galliani, or Rochefoucauld, even though he has never heard of these seers of the soul. So, destiny and destiny thinkers is, is about the inner necessity of the being which organically uh, unfolds and external uh, incidents may interfere and interrupt and determine its fate, but they don't change its inner being, its inner essence, its inner necessity that it's actualizing in the world. And causality is the mechanical working out of what must happen among the inorganic. But for the organic, there is a, there is a unique expression, and that's for the individual, for the nation that is an organ of the culture, and for the culture itself. This is pretty uh, heady, uh, abstract, philosophical stuff. I think we're going to stop right there. We've made our way up to, uh, next up, we have the two aspects of history, but we'll pick up on that uh, tomorrow. So thanks for listening to me today, and I'll be back with you tomorrow real, real soon.